think we'll make a start. Uh, I'm going to talk to you now about diffusion, the beginning of uh, the kinetics series of lectures. And we're going to start by treating diffusion as a random walk problem. So supposing you are located at this position and you take lots of random steps, then what would be the distance that you travel after a certain number of steps? Okay. So supposing that this is the origin, and the step length is lambda. Then after one step, what is your mean position? Remember that you can walk uh, you know, in plus and minus directions. So the step length is lambda. You can walk plus or minus lambda. What is your mean position after one step? Read along this way. You, you are jumping ahead, is it? So, okay. <laughs> the mean mean position, because you could travel this way or this way, zero. is zero. zero. Okay, so uh, the first step you have x1 bar is equal to zero, but the root mean square position will be uh, x1 squared will be lambda squared, because it doesn't matter what sign it is, it will be lambda squared. Now, how about uh, x2? What will be the length of x2? Well, first of all, we have to start from x1, okay? So, x1 plus or minus lambda. And then we have the mean squared position will be x1 bar plus lambda squared. Yeah? And I can then expand that as x1, sorry, this is plus or minus lambda. So x1 bar squared plus or minus 2x1 bar lambda plus lambda squared. Right? What is the value of this term? Zero, because we've decided that x1 bar is zero. So this will be our root mean square, uh, our mean squared value, which is simply 2 lambda squared. Because the size of x1, uh, the size of our step is <coughs> lambda. So I've summarized the calculation over here. We're given a step length of lambda, equal probability of left or right, Therefore, the position after the first step is x1 plus or minus lambda, and the mean value will be zero. <coughs> but that's not the case for the mean squared position, which will be lambda squared. And when I take the second step, it'll be 2 lambda squared, and so on. So if you take a drunken walk, and n is the number of steps that you take, then the root mean square distance you will have traveled is root n into lambda. Because if I take the square root of this, it will be root 2 into lambda. Happy with that? So we can summarize that the mean distance that you've traveled is the step length times the square root of the number of steps. You could try this out at some time yourself and work out the distance that you travel from the origin. So n is, of course, the number of steps or the number of jumps of atoms. And we can replace n by the frequency of steps multiplied by the time. Okay, so how many steps you take per unit of time multiplied by the time gives you the number of steps. So if you think about this as the jump frequency and the time for diffusion and the minimum distance between jumps, then you realize that the diffusion distance will be proportional to the square root of time. In a random walk process, if atoms are moving about, then <coughs> the distance they will diffuse will be proportional to the square root of time. And you find that the square root of time turns up in all of the diffusion equations that we are going to do in all of the kinetic theory 
wherever diffusion dominates the process, things will change parabolically with time, with the square root of time. So if I plot that, I have the distance um, versus time will follow a curve like this, parabolic relation. Very, very good rough guide as to the distance that atoms diffuse. Of course, it isn't uh, going to be very useful in practice because things happen down a diffusion gradient, a concentration gradient. So it isn't really random walks happening, but they're being directed by the force that we discussed in the last lecture. Nevertheless, the square root term will turn up in all of the diffusion equations. Now we go on to de derive Fix's first law of diffusion, which is diffusion down a concentration gradient. And this illustrates the concentration gradient. The capital C is a concentration per unit volume. So the units here would be per unit volume. X is the distance along here. And this is how solute is distributed across that distance x. And of course the solute is in the form of atoms, and let's say we are dealing with a crystalline solid, then we have two kinds of atoms here, and you can see that the concentration of atoms here is different from the concentration of atoms here, because we are moving down this gradient. Now we will assume that we have a unit area going into, each one of these planes has a unit area. Okay. So the jumps are happening across a unit area. We can now write the flux of atoms from the left to the right hand side as being proportional to the jump frequency. You know, it's attempting jumps from one plane to the other, so we have a, a jump frequency here. Why do you think we have one sixth? <coughs> and remember, atoms can jump. Why do we have one sixth? Six possible, Six possible directions in which they can jump, right? And we are only considering the flux along the x direction, and therefore we have to uh, take all the attempts at jumping, divide that by six. That is the effective jump frequency in the x direction. Now, the reason why we are multiplying by lambda is that the concentration is the concentration per unit volume, and we want to find the amount of solute we have in this plane. And that plane has a thickness lambda, and it has an area of 1, because I said it has a cross-sectional area of 1. So the volume of that plane is simply lambda, isn't it? So concentration times lambda gives you the number of solid atoms that we have in that particular slab of plane. Is that clear to everybody? Sometimes people get confused about this lambda because it's actually representing volume because we are treating a unit area. Although lambda itself is meters, not meters cubed. You happy with that? Concentration times the volume of this plane gives you the number of solid atoms that you have in that unit area of that plane. Are you happy with that? Okay, so that's the flux, which has units of atoms per meter squared per unit time. Okay. This is the flux of atoms going from this plane to this plane. I have to take account of atoms which are jumping back as well. And therefore, I have another flux, which is going from the right-hand side to the left-hand side which again we have the effective jump frequency along the minus x direction. Now the concentration here is different from the concentration here. It's changed by this value delta c. You can see that from this graph. So this represents the number of solute atoms in this plane. Oh, this green circle is atoms. Um, circle is nothing. No, no, uh, there are no vacancies here at the moment. Uh, I'm just, uh, I just want to highlight that there are two species of atoms. Two different types of atoms. Two different types of atoms. 
As a volume, as a volume. Uh, it is actually a length. Okay, but we are considering one unit area. Lambda is in this direction, and we are considering one unit area. So if I multiply lambda by one, that gives me the volume of this plane, the unit area of this plane. Okay, and then I multiply by concentration, which is atoms per unit volume. So I get the number of solute atoms in a unit area of this plane. Okay. Right, so um, the concentration in this plane is simply C plus delta C. And I can replace delta C by lambda multiplied by dc dx. In other words, lambda is the distance along here multiplied by the gradient here gives me delta C. Right? So I get C plus lambda into dc by dx times lambda. And now the net flux along the x direction will be the difference between these two values. In other words, this, take away this, which comes to minus one sixth times the jump frequency, lambda squared dc by dx, and we write that as minus d times dc dx. Okay, so all we've done is taken the difference between this and this. We want to look at the flux along the x direction, so it's left to right, take away right to left, and that leaves me with just this term here. And we lump all these values, 1 sixth, nu, into lambda squared, as a diffusion coefficient. And this is where Fixie's first law of diffusion comes, that the flux along the x direction is minus a diffusion coefficient times the gradient of concentration. Does that make sense? What is the meaning of that minus sign? So if it, what is the direction in which diffusion is happening? It's along x, isn't it? Positive x. What is the value of the gradient here? Negative. It's negative. So if I didn't have that minus sign, then diffusion would actually be happening along here, this direction. Okay, so that minus sign allows for the fact that this is negative. It comes naturally out of taking the difference between left to right minus right to left. But you must appreciate that this is negative. This gradient here is negative. Yeah, the concentration is decreasing as x increases. Now, what is the key assumption here in deriving these equations? that everything depends on concentration gradient. Yep. Because we've simply said that the probability of jumps in this direction will be proportional to the number of solute atoms here. And similarly, in this case, the jump, uh, jumps in this direction will be proportional to the number of solute atoms there. So the key assumption is that the flux is proportional to the concentration gradient. And we haven't actually justified that in any way. It seems intuitively, it seems correct, but we haven't justified it. By the end of this lecture, you'll see a different interpretation of this. So everyone happy with Fix's first law of diffusion? Notice that this concentration gradient is constant. And because it's constant, there's no time dependence of the flux. The flux is also constant. If you have a constant concentration gradient, the flux is also constant. But we now consider a case where the gradient is not linear, okay, so concentration versus x, or it might be something like this, in which case the flux will not be constant, it will vary with time. Yeah. This is just to make you feel a bit more relaxed. Okay? Hap happens to be my screensaver. Okay. So fix this first law is straightforward, and we can relate it to that random jump theory that we derived earlier. This is the law, of, um, the flux is proportional to the concentration gradient times the diffusion coefficient. We have information which comes from the crystal structure of what the diffusion coefficient is. This is basically the spacing between the planes in the crystal, that's the minimum jump distance. And this will be determined by the vibration frequencies that we have. 
in the lattice. And that, of course, is a coordination number. It need not be six. You know, it could be 12 nearest neighboring atoms or whatever. So this information will, uh, comes from the nature of your material. How do you really determine the frequency? Uh, you mean fundamentally determine it or, or measure it? So fundamentally, you know, when we plotted that heat capacity curve in the lecture on thermodynamics, Cp versus T, it had this form, did it? Yeah. Uh, and if we are in this regime, then things are vibrating approximately 10 to the power of 13 times per second. Okay. That's called the d by frequency. When we get to here, things change. Okay. And you have to have the right theory to produce this curve to determine that frequency. So, you know, you're considering lots of things oscillating in a coordinated manner, so it gets a bit complicated. But you will see how we actually derive the diffusion coefficient, because there is a lot more detail here than I have actually presented. Now, of course, we had this jump frequency related to the mean uh, diffusion distance, uh, mean uh, uh, distance in a random walk as the step length times square root of nu t, so we can substitute for nu in here, and therefore you find that the mean diffusion distance is proportional to square root of dt. So this is a very good way of working out a mean, a rough diffusion distance. Say, say you are diffusing a solute from a surface into a substrate, and you want a certain depth then you could estimate roughly the heat treatment time if you knew the diffusion distance. And again, this root dt will appear in many equations. But the diffusion distance is also constant. No, 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 because look, there's a time here. Uh, no, from this one, the upper equation fixed flux. No, this is just telling you that the flux is constant. The solute coming in all the time. But of course, the distance is increasing. You know, we have a constant gradient, so the flux is constant, but the diffusion distance is increasing all the time. I mean, you can see that from here as well. Where is with root of time. Okay, let's now consider the case where we don't have a constant concentration gradient. So obviously, if I consider two planes here, the flux into this plane will be different from the flux into this plane, right? Because the gradient here is shallower than the gradient here. That means that there will be a build-up of solute in this region. If the flux leaving this space is less than the flux entering it, then clearly the concentration here will change, right? So now we have a time dependence of flux. <coughs> okay, so again, looking at that diagram, we'll look at the flux going into plane 1 and the flux into plane 2. So into plane 1, we have the diffusion coefficient times the gradient which exists at this point. Okay. Similarly, with Fix's uh, first law, for this plane, we have diffusion coefficient times the gradient which is different now. It exists at this point two, right? These two are no longer identical. We have here a curve instead of a straight line. Stop me if you don't follow, all right? Okay, so let's uh, replace this by saying this is equal to the gradient at point one plus the distance delta x here times the rate at which the gradient changes with distance d squared c by dx squared is simply how the gradient is changing with distance here. So you can see the slope over here is changing with distance. That's all that term is. Yeah? And then it becomes very easy because we take the difference between those two to find the change in concentration here as a function of time. So we have dc times dx, which is this volume of material. Uh, equals the flux in minus flux out times delta t. Okay, so we just substitute these terms in here 
and you find Fix's second law that the rate at which concentration changes with time is equal to d times the rate at which the gradient changes with distance. If this is zero, then the concentration doesn't change with time, and we end up with Fix's first law. Now these are the two fundamental equations of diffusion and from this we can derive a lot of useful uh, theory to deal with uh, industrial problems or even scientific problems. Do you have any questions so far? Okay, so let's derive the first uh, useful solution. So we're looking at what we call a semi-infinite bar. So we have a bar, we've plated some material on top of it, some solute. Let's say this is uh, silicon here, and we've implanted, we've put a layer of phosphorus on top, and that this is long enough to be treated as semi-infinite. In other words, the concentration far away is not going to change. If you monitor then the concentration as a function of distance and time, you start off with a thin layer of material, phosphorus, at the surface. As you allow diffusion, it spreads out into the material. Okay. This, this point here falls because we are not supplying new phosphorus here. We simply put a layer of phosphorus and allow it to diffuse. And as time proceeds, it flattens out further and further and further. Now, obviously, you have to use Fix's second law to treat this and subject to some boundary conditions. And the boundary conditions, the first one is that we are not putting in any more mass. We just put a thin layer of phosphorus on the surface and we are allowing it to diffuse. So at any instant of time, if you add up all the phosphorus, it's got to be the same amount that you started off with, right? Conservation of mass, that's this condition, that the integral of all the solute, function of distance and time, must be the value you started off with. Straightforward. And the second thing is that when we start the process, there is actually no solid present in this bar. So that's, that's what we call boundary conditions. And then you try out various functions which would satisfy Fix's law with these boundary conditions. And you find that the concentration varies exponentially with x squared over 4 dt, where x is the distance, and d is the diffusion coefficient and the time. So it's an exponential penetration into your material. Now, how do I know that I get this equation if I solve Fix's law with uh, assuming those two boundary conditions? How, how did I get to this equation? It's like the solution of any differential equation. You have some trial the trial functions that you attempt and see whether the fit fixes law plus the boundary condition. So if you if you differentiate this twice, you'll find that dc by dt is equal to d times d squared c by dx squared, fixes second law. You'll also find that at t equals zero, x equals zero, the concentration here will be zero. And so on. Okay? So this is called the exponential uh, diffusion function. Notice it has root dt's twice in it. So we've got root dt here, and of course this is a square, so we have dt here. This is simply the amount of material you have placed on the surface. And this, this solution comes in many, many applications. For example, if you take a piece of steel and you're forcing carbon into the surface to harden the surface, then you could put a layer of carbon, allow it to diffuse. If you are making uh, doping semiconductors, you know, things like phosphorus or silicon, again, this is the solution that you would use. Right. The next solution is a situation where we have two bars of different chemical compositions joined together and they extend to infinity in either direction. Okay. So these are of different chemical composition 
they extend to infinity in either direction. So each bar is semi-infinite. And if you monitor the change in composition, it starts off as this step and then decays as you allow time to proceed with the concentration in the middle remaining the mean concentration. And we describe this behavior in terms of what's known as an error function. And this looks very complicated, doesn't it? But actually, it is simply a derivation from the exponential solution we had. If I just remind you again, the exponential solution, we had a very thin layer plated onto a large bar. Supposing now I put another thin layer here, and another thin layer, and another thin layer, and carry on till infinity, then it's like I'm superimposing different exponential functions. So each layer corresponds to an exponential function located at a particular value of z, z being along here. If I put another layer, it's a slightly displaced with respect to this, and another layer, and another layer. So all I've got to do is to add up all these exponential functions, and that will give me the diffusion profile for a semi-infinite bar on this side. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I'm going to treat this semi-infinite bar as a whole series of exponential functions located at different positions, and add up all their effects. And that is the meaning of the error function. There's nothing magical. It wasn't a mad mathematician who thought, okay, let's define an error function like this. You can see that it is an integral of lots of exponential functions which are located at different positions. Does that make sense? So, initially we had simply one layer here on a semi-infinite bar If I put a second layer on here, then it's like having another exponential function which is slightly displaced. Right? I can carry that on indefinitely and sum up the effect of all those exponential functions and that's what we mean by an error function. That's the physical meaning of an error function. And the boundary conditions again are that at the midpoint, irrespective of time, the concentration remains at that mean value and obviously at x equals zero and time equals zero the concentration has a particular value c naught and this is how the error function describes the profiles that are described here now those are the two key solutions to the diffusion equations and they describe a huge family of problems and the meaning of the error function is simply a superposition of a whole series of exponential functions located at different positions. Okay? Everybody happy with that? Okay. Let's now uh, go back to the crystalline structure of matter and think about uh, solid state diffusion. And, you know, you mentioned uh, that there might be vacancies in the material, right? Does everybody know what a vacancy is? It's, a, it's an atom which is missing from its normal position. So it's a hole left in the crystal. Now, when we have these large atoms here, it's difficult for them to move by any mechanism other than moving into a vacant site. So here we might have this atom jumping into a vacant site and the vacant site jumping in the opposite direction. We will prove that shortly that diffusion happens by a vacancy mechanism and not, for example, by these two atoms swapping positions. Or even a ring diffusion method where they all jump together and rotate. On the other hand, very frequently, we have very small atoms inside the, lat inside the lattice consisting of large atoms. And those mat small atoms are more comfortable in the interstices. The interstices means the holes between the atoms. And they can move much more readily because there are lots of these channels inside the crystalline structure. So this is called interstitial diffusion. And interstice is simply a hole in the structure. You know, when you put spheres together, you can't fill all of space, right? 
because they are spheres and there will be space left between the spheres and therefore small atoms can lodge for example hydrogen in iron it can lodge inside the holes and then diffuse much more rapidly than in, in this case because the chances of finding a vacancy are actually very small of the order of 10 to the minus 6 at a high temperature about 10 to the minus 6 atoms will be missing from this site and there will be vacant sites. Now, given that, you know, there are so few vacancies, there was a lot of controversy a long time ago on the mechanism of diffusion inside a solid. You know, if only a millionth of the sites are vacant, then what are the chances of diffusion happening? We'll come back to that problem, but we can we can expand that term we had, which was the jump frequency, into a fundamental jump frequency, which is like the d by frequency. 10 to the, all the atoms are vibrating at a certain frequency, let's say 10 to the 13 times per second. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that the atom actually jumps 10 to the 13 times. It means that it attempts a jump 10 to the 13 times per second, right? Whether or not that jump is successful, depends on the barrier across which it jumps. Because to move from one equilibrium position to another, there will be some kind of an obstacle. You'll have to push past other atoms. So that's what we call an activation barrier. So if these are the equilibrium positions here. And free energy being plotted here. If an atom wants to go from this position to this position, it's got to push past other atoms and therefore it has to cross this barrier, G star. It's vibrating all the time and Sometimes it will be successful in overcoming that barrier and the probability of a successful jump is minus G star upon KT because the excess energy that it requires in order to get over this bump comes from thermal vibrations. So this is simply the probability of a successful jump, G star over KT. So obviously at low temperatures this becomes very difficult because this exponential term will be very small when T is large. That makes sense because diffusion at low temperature is more difficult than diffusion at high temperature. And I can expand this activation free energy into an activation entropy and an activation enthalpy. And in the textbooks, sometimes they don't explain what they mean by activation energy. You know, this is an enthalpy. This is an entropy and this is a free energy. You should really think in terms of just those three quantities rather than using general terms like energy. Energy could be anything. It could be enthalpy, it could be Gibbs free energy, it could be Helmholtz free energy, and so forth. Now, obviously, this term is independent of temperature. So, we could simply summarize this as D is equal to the temperature independent term D naught, which we call the pre exponential factor, the activation enthalpy, and KT. K is Boltzmann's constant, and T is the absolute temperature. So this is, this is how diffusion coefficients are defined by two terms. One is D naught, the pre exponential term, and the other is the activation enthalpy. H star, which is often called a Q in a lot of the literature. So what we define is the temperature dependence of the diffusion coefficient. And if I plot, if I take the uh, natural logs on both sides, then this will become uh, the log of D is equal to the log of D naught minus H star upon kt. So if I plot the log of the diffusion coefficient versus 1 upon t, then the gradient is given by minus h star upon k. 
So I could derive the activation energy, uh, activation enthalpy, by measuring the diffusion coefficient as a function of temperature. And similarly, I can get D naught from the intercept. So here are some typical graphs where we are plotting the logarithm of diffusion coefficient versus the reciprocal of temperature. And you can see that uh, they are straight lines. I mean, this is just my drawing that there are points at each end because I didn't want to plot several points. Okay, that's laziness. But obviously, you have to have more than two points to know that it's a straight line. Okay. What I'd like you to comment on is why is the diffusion coefficient of carbon so much higher, many, many orders of magnitude higher, than, say, of copper in iron? Why is the diffusion coefficient of carbon so many orders of magnitude higher? Carbon is small, lighter atom as compared to iron. Yeah, it's, it's a small atom, so it sits inside the holes in the crystal, and it has no difficulty in finding vacancies next to it, yeah, because there are lots and lots of these holes. So it can move in between the large atoms. Whereas in the case of copper, it is like a substitutional atom, and there has to be a vacancy created next to it in order for it to move. But this is now a very well established relationship that the logarithm of the diffusion coefficient varies with the reciprocal of temperature. Okay, let's now try and prove that substitutional diffusion occurs only by a vacancy mechanism. I explained to you that if there was no hole over here, then the atom could only move by exchanging places. That requires the coordinated movement of two atoms. And you can imagine, if this is trying to rotate together, that would cause a lot of strain, wouldn't it? So it doesn't seem like a very lively mechanism, but you can't rule it out. You could argue that, you know, if we have only a millionth of sites vacant, then also the vacancy mechanism is not very realistic, right? Alternatively, you could reduce the distortions by making four atoms move together. Okay. If, if all four of them moved and swapped positions, then the distortions would be smaller. But then you require coordination between four atoms. And that's very difficult. You know, to get four atoms to move in the right direction must be quite difficult. If I, if I get a whole cluster of atoms to move together, the distortion becomes even smaller, but I require coordination between all those atoms. So, around the 1940s, there was huge disagreement about the mechanism of diffusion in the solid state. Until Kirkendall and Smigelkast did a very, very neat experiment. And the experiment is as follows. We have a diffusion couple. That means we have joined together two pieces of material which have different chemical compositions. So this is rich in the A atoms on this side and rich in the B atoms on this side. And before you begin diffusion, you put inert markers here. That means markers which are not going to dissolve in the material, but are fixed. And if this is my diffusion couple here, I put markers which are fixed to the bench. So I know exactly where the interface between the A rich and the B rich region is. And I've chosen this system so that the diffusion of A in B is faster than the diffusion of B in A. So the diffusion coefficient of A is greater than that of B. Yeah? And they are both substitutional atoms. Now, because dA is greater than dB, I have a larger flux of A atoms in this direction than of B atoms in the opposite direction. Right? So if this was my marker, there's more matter going in this direction than in this direction, so the whole specimen is going to move on the bench. Right? That's what's described here. You can see that I've ended up with more material on this side of the marker than on this side. That can only happen if you have a vacancy mechanism. If you have a place exchange, 
then if one atom goes this way, another atom has to go in the opposite direction. So this beautiful, simple experiment conclusively proves that the mechanism of diffusion in the vast majority of cases is by a vacancy mechanism. This is the kind of experiment I would love to do to prove something. You know, it is so simple and there is no ambiguity in the interpretation of the result. You can physically see the specimen move as a function of time. So this is called the Kirkendall experiment, although it was Kirkendall and Smigelkart who actually did the work together. You can, you can actually see this when you make diffusion couples. So here, for example, are uh, layers of copper, nickel, copper, nickel, copper, nickel. And this is before diffusion. You allow diffusion and you end up with porosity. That means large holes. You can see large holes here inside the copper. Now the reason why you end up with large holes oops, is that look, if I've got matter moving in this direction, then I've got vacancies moving in the opposite direction, and they will tend to condense here, vacancies will tend to cluster and form porosity, holes. Yeah. And that's what you see in this, uh, oops, sorry. Yeah, that's what you see in this slide. After diffusion, you end up with lots and lots of holes. Now, of course, this is a nice method of producing a porous metal. If you wanted a porous metal, this is a nice method of producing it. You know, right now, there's a whole series of lectures going on in the Royal Society on metallic forms. This is a wonderful way of producing controlled porosity. And this is another example. Uh, niobium tin. NB3SN is a superconducting metal, a compound, but it's very brittle. So if you want to form cables of it, you wouldn't form it out of niobium tin. So what you do is you take bronze. Bronze is a mixture of copper and tin. You drill holes into it and you put niobium, which is a very ductile material like copper. And you draw it out into long wires. And then you allow diffusion of the tin to combine with the niobium to form the superconducting compound NB3SN. So after you've made it into the form of wires, you heat treat it to allow diffusion to form this compound. And if you look very closely, uh, this is now NB3SN. It's after the diffusion has happened and tin from the bronze has diffused combined with the niobium to form NB3SN and you end up with porosity. And that is again Kirkendall porosity because the diffusivity of tin in niobium is different from niobium in tin. So around every one of those filaments you find these holes. So this is a real fact, Kirkendall porosity. There's one other thing, uh, you know, we've already talked about vacancies, which are defects. Yeah, there's an atom missing from its normal side, so it's a defect, right? Uh, what other defects do you know of that exist in crystalline materials? Dislocations. Dislocations, everyone familiar with dislocations? Yeah. <laughs> And one of the characteristics of a, a defect is that it has more space. Yeah. You know, if, if you have, for example, a dislocation, so these are planes of atoms, then in this region I've got more space, haven't I? And that forms an easy path for diffusion. So we need to think about structure-sensitive diffusion. That means that supposing this much of my material is perfectly crystalline, but I have this much of it which is defective and has a much higher diffusion coefficient, then clearly the flux in this direction is going to be greater than I expect. Right? Because obviously flux is going in through the perfect material, but it'll be going in faster through the defective material. Right? And the fraction of defective material from simple geometry is the thickness of this region to delta divided by the thickness uh, diameter of this region. 
So the total flux will be the flux through the perfect <coughs> material plus the flux through that grain boundary, the defective region, scales with the fraction of that defective region. And this is nearly one because the boundary is a very thin region of material. So your measured diffusion coefficient will be a function of diffusion through the perfect lattice plus diffusion through the grain boundary scales with the fraction of grain boundary you have in your material. Yeah? Now when you plot the log of this diffusion coefficient versus 1 upon t, it won't be a straight line because these are two different functions of temperature. So it, it will in fact be a curve depending on which process dominates. Okay? Finally, uh, just to uh, leave you with something to think about for the next lecture, strictly speaking, diffusion is driven by free energy gradients, not by concentration gradients. So here we have the flux of A will be related to the chemical potential gradient of A. Remember, chemical potential is the mean free energy of an A atom in a solution of a particular composition. And everything will happen to reduce that gradient of free energy. And we no longer have the diffusion coefficient here, but we have another term which we call the mobility. And if we compare that with fixes for slow, okay, so here we have chemical potential gradient and here we have concentration gradient, then we can derive a relationship between D and the mobility here and the gradient of chemical potential with respect to X and this is how the chemical potential varies with composition. So, we can use our thermodynamic theory to see how that diffusion coefficient will change with concentration. So, the diffusion coefficient now becomes a concentration dependent term. And if we express it like this, then we can still use Fix's first law to deal with diffusion theory. In the next lecture, I'll show you that this can actually be negative, in which case the diffusion coefficient becomes negative. What does that mean, a negative diffusion coefficient? That means solid will climb up a concentration gradient. Yeah? So you will go from solid poor regions to solid rich regions. So I'll show you circumstances where you get what's known as uphill diffusion. <coughs> if this term is zero, the diffusion coefficient becomes zero. And it's only when this is positive that you get diffusion happening down a concentration gradient. Now I'm going to develop this in the next lecture, so don't worry if you don't follow all this. But the point is that we should be thinking about free energy gradients rather than concentration gradients. Okay? Any questions? Okay, see you tomorrow.